Hey guys, today I'll show you a supernatural horror TV series named Evil Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a girl named Kristen, who is a forensic psychologist working at the local district attorney's office. Sitting opposite her is a serial killer, Orson, who is accused of murdering three families. When Kristen presents the crime scene photos, asking if he was the one who inflicted the injuries on the victims, Orson claims he can't remember. After unsuccessful questioning, Kristen resorts to a psychological test. Orson breezes through the first few questions, but when Kristen asks whether he enjoys hearing women scream like a chicken, he falls silent. In court, Kristen informs the prosecutor that Orson scored extremely low on the psychological test, within the range indicative of deceit. This suggests that Orson possessed independent cognitive abilities at the time of the crime. Just as Orson's lawyer begins to cast doubt on Kristen's testimony, a priest called David enters through a side door and takes a seat. Simultaneously, the defense attorney submits new evidence to the judge, a medical statement alleging that Orson was possessed by a demon at the time of the crimes. After court, Kristen heads to the interrogation room, only to find that David got there before her, asking the suspect questions. Annoyed, she finds Ben, who is David's partner working as his technical expert and equipment handler. She sternly tells him that coaching a suspect on how to behave is illegal. David then exits the room. As Kristen prepares to enter, David hands her a crucifix, asking if she believes in God. Visibly irritated, Kristen proceeds into the interrogation room. Before her is Orson, insisting that he was unconscious when the crimes occurred. With no other option, Kristen stands to leave. As she does, she remembers David's words, draws a cross on the table, and begins to recite a prayer. Upon hearing the prayer, Orson lunges at Kristen. Orson is soon pulled away, all the while muttering about ascending to heaven. Once outside, Kristen seeks out her supervisor, stating that she needs more time to assess Orson. However, her supervisor insists that she stick to her court testimony, urging her to quickly close the case. Angry, Kristen informs her supervisor that she's quitting. Afterward, Kristen, carrying a cake, returned to her home. As she and her mother were decorating, she received a check from her husband through her mother. However, this small amount of money was not nearly enough to support Kristen's family. That night, after unwrapping gifts and reading a story to her daughter, one of her daughters found her, saying that someone had called, threatening her about a debt. Angry, Kristen returned the call and then took a beer from the fridge to drink. Just then, the doorbell rang. It turned out to be David, who had found her address and came over. Upon arriving at her home office, David invited Kristen to help him deal with some supernatural cases the church was facing. During the conversation, David told Kristen that Orson's wife also believed Orson was possessed by a demon. Given that Orson now only communicated with Kristen, David had no choice but to seek her help. Considering her financial needs to care for her four daughters, Kristen finally agreed to David's request. At home, Orson's wife told everyone that Orson often talked to himself, and she had heard demonic whispers in the house. She played a recording for everyone to hear. Watching Ben use equipment to investigate, Kristen stepped outside to find David. Listening to David speak about miracles and science, Kristen, a believer in science, found herself at a loss for words. Upon returning home from work, Kristen began researching online and even looked up information about David. Just then, Kristen felt the presence of someone in her house. After confirming she was alone, she returned to her room to sleep. In the middle of the night, Kristen woke up to see a demon emerging from the floor lamp. As the demon slowly approached her, Kristen insisted it was all fake. The demon, however, demonstrated to her through actions that she was not dreaming. It also told Kristen his name was George. Seeing the demon crawl under her blanket, Kristen screamed and her daughters rushed into the bedroom. When Kristen looked towards the window, she found a puddle of unidentifiable liquid. Upon closer inspection, it was rainwater that had seeped in through the window. The next day, Kristen told her doctor about the previous night's events. Upon hearing that Kristen was investigating a demon possession case, the doctor prescribed her some sleeping pills. Upon leaving, Kristen and the others returned to Orson's home. Ben informed everyone that the so-called demonic whispers were merely the result of soap clogging the dishwasher and demonstrated it to everyone. Kristen praised Ben, who told her that he was actually an atheist and informed her that David was in training to become a priest. Since it was confirmed that there were no demonic whispers, Kristen and David returned to the interrogation room and had Orson write a few letters. After looking at the letters Orson wrote, Kristen stated she couldn't see anything wrong. They exchanged pleasantries before returning to their respective homes. Upon returning home, Kristen chose not to take the sleeping pills. Instead, she pasted papers with text onto her ceiling. As expected, the demon found Kristen again in the wee hours. This time, it held a knife, prodding Kristen to solve riddles with it. Seeing Kristen's 
Kristen's reluctance, the demon cut her hand without hesitation. Frightened, Kristen had no choice but to comply with the demon. When Kristen denied having any romantic involvement with David, the demon didn't hesitate to cut off one of her fingers. As the demon continued to press her, Kristen was barely able to read the words on the ceiling and told the demon that during sleep, the part of the brain responsible for semantic analysis is in a dormant state. Thus, she insisted that everything was just a dream. Infuriated, the demon stabbed Kristen in the chest. Awakening in shock, Kristen could clearly see the words on the ceiling this time. In the morning, Kristen and David sought out Orson, hoping he could replicate a drawing. However, Orson started to move his handcuffs up and down, incessantly muttering in Latin. David then learned that Kristen, too, was being tormented by a demon. Just then, Orson revealed what had happened to Kristen the previous night. Hearing the demon's name, George, Kristen was extremely frightened. Outside, Kristen asked David what Orson had said before she left. Reluctantly, David told her that George would slit her daughter's throats. Kristen then drove to her doctor, the only person who knew her secret, and began questioning him. When Kristen asked the doctor to look at her treatment records, she found them missing. Kristen returned to the prison to check Orson's visitor log, where she found a visitor named Townsend, the same person who had initially testified to the judge that Orson was indeed possessed by a demon. Over the phone, Kristen also learned that Townsend had made an appointment with her doctor but left before the doctor arrived. She suspected her doctor had slipped her private information to Townsend. That could explain how Orson knew about her dream of the demon the previous night, rather than that he was possessed. As Kristen questioned Townsend about why he sided with the suspect, he warned her about overstepping her bounds. He also offered to take care of her four daughters. At this point, David arrived and immediately recognized Townsend, who provoked David by mentioning his friend. Enraged, David punched Townsend, knocking him down. In the bar, Kristen found David, who was drinking alone. David told her that people could even use social media to encourage others to commit murders and turn them into demons. Thinking of social media, Kristen and David listened again to Orson's self-muttered recordings. This time, they heard new password in the recording, indicating that Orson was indeed hiding something. Kristen went to the prison and told Orson that they found his communications with Townsend in his wife's email, as well as evidence of him using his wife's email to evade a murder charge. With that, the truth was revealed, and Orson would spend the rest of his life in prison. That night, as the three of them were celebrating with drinks, David brought up the next mission sent by the church about a medical miracle. Kristen agreed to join them. Soon after, Kristen received this new case. Watching the footage, David told everyone that the teenage girl, Clark, died of a sudden heart attack during a soccer match. Despite emergency resuscitation by medical staff, they were unable to save Clark's life. At that moment, everyone saw the priest whisper a few words in Clark's ear. After he left, Clark, who was being prepared for an autopsy, miraculously came back to life. What's incredible is that Clark resurrected three hours after the doctor declared her dead. After watching the footage, the three of them went to the hospital where the incident occurred for investigation. However, the dean of the hospital blamed the emergency personnel for their unprofessional methods. Seeing David's confusion, the dean simply told him that during CPR, excess air remained in the lungs, which caused Clark to be unable to breathe normally. The three of them then found the emergency doctor for confirmation, but he defended himself, stating that he could not possibly have made such a basic mistake during the rescue. He also told them he saw liver mortis on Clark and confirmed brain death. But now that she had resurrected, he was somewhat confused. Kristen wanted to see the surveillance footage, but she was told that the footage had been deleted by the hospital. With no other options, Kristen returned to her former workplace to ask for a copy of the surveillance footage. She ran into her former boss, who offered her a more attractive contract for two years, which tempted Kristen. When Kristen returned, she gave the video to David. Watching the footage, the three of them confirmed that the rescue team had correctly performed CPR. At that moment, a flash appeared on the screen. They slowed down the footage and saw a woman's face. David's partner, Ben, who is an atheist, firmly believed that the video was forged. Kristen discussed the medical miracle with David and told him about her former boss's offer to return to work. She also told him that she might have to go back to her old job because her daughter has congenital heart disease and she needs a more stable and well-paid job. At night, Kristen was awakened by her daughter's scream. Rushing to her bedside, Kristen confirmed that everything was all right. She then brought her dreaming daughter to her own bed to sleep together. As Kristen was comforting her daughter to sleep, the little girl told her about seeing the demon George in her dream. Hearing this, Kristen grew anxious too. The next morning, Kristen shared with the doctor her and her daughter's dream of the same demon. 
However, the doctor told Kristen that they only dreamed of the same demon because they had seen the same image. He also encouraged Kristen to continue seeking therapy. Meanwhile, at the church, David was able to persuade the priest to offer Kristen a similar two-year work contract. Ben also arrived at the hospital, questioning the security about whether the memory card could be reused. The security guard told Ben that they recognized the figure in the footage as a patient of the hospital. Coincidentally, that patient died of a brain aneurysm one hour before Clark's surgery. Just as Kristen was starting to believe in body possession, Ben insisted that someone tampered with the footage. Seeing an angry Ben storm off, David and Kristen had no choice but to question the priest who had whispered to Clark. The priest denied any unusual actions, and during the conversation they learned that the priest was an alcoholic and not a devout believer. Kristen, left without any leads, went to her former boss and decided to accept the job offer from the attorney's office. But the boss informed her that they had already found a new hire who was Townsend. Hearing this, Kristen seriously warned her boss not to hire Townsend, but the boss dismissed her advice, assuming she was driven by jealousy and discrediting Townsend. As Kristen left the office in anger, she was stopped by Townsend. Just as Kristen was expressing their differences in beliefs, Townsend told Kristen that David was not as good as he seemed, and suggested that Kristen ask David about his second encounter with God. Upon returning home, Kristen and her daughters began watching a horror movie at Daniel C.C. Movie Channel. When they saw a demon in the film that looked like George, Kristen rushes everyone to sleep, leaving behind her youngest daughter. She tried to explain to her daughter that the demon they dreamed of was triggered by similar images they had seen during the day. She also agreed to her daughter's request to sleep together. As Kristen was working alone in her studio, she heard a knock on the door. When she opened the door, she found no one there. Just as Kristen was locking the door to continue working, the knock resounded again. When Kristen opened the door, she saw a shadow dart into her house. Chasing after the shadow, Kristen ended up in front of her daughter's room. However, she was too late as screams emanated from the room. Kristen opened her eyes only to see the demon appear at the bedside. The demon came up to her youngest daughter with a knife, and despite Kristen's calls, she couldn't wake her up. As the demon pointed the knife towards her daughter's heart, Kristen painfully pleaded for the demon to stop. Just then, Kristen was awoken by her daughter beside her. Looking at her little girl, Kristen realized she had just experienced a dream within a dream. The next day, Kristen told David about her encounter with Townsend and asked what happened during David's second encounter with God. David confessed to her that he had once experienced a hallucination, but it was gone now. He also suggested that Townsend was trying to instigate doubt between them. At the studio, the three of them reviewed the surveillance footage once again. This time, Ben offered a possibility. He suggested that the videos of the teenage girl Clark and the patient who died of a brain aneurysm had been crossed and overlapped during transmission to the security system, leading to the weird phenomenon they experienced. At this point, this was the only plausible explanation they had. Just then, David noticed something strange about the time displayed in the corner of the monitor. Armed with hospital emergency data, he confronted the hospital administrator, only to uncover a simple case of hidden discrimination. The hospital spent an average of about an hour on emergency care for white patients, while the time for African-American patients was less than half an hour. David reported this inequity to the Ethics Review Board. With that, the mystery of Clark's resurrection was solved. Back at the church, David submitted his report, explaining to the priest that it was just a medical accident. However, when he handed over the photos to the priest, hoping to continue the investigation, the priest nonchalantly accepted them, instructing David to move on to the next strange case. Back home, Kristen continued binge-watching Daniel C.C. horror movies with her daughters. This time, she also showed them the behind-the-scenes footage of the demon from the horror movie. Meanwhile, David went for a night run, stopped by a club, and purchased some new items. After returning home and making a drink from what he had bought, he lay in bed and saw another hallucination. The scene then shifts to an office lady, who asked for help from the church. However, she was not the one who was possessed. She suspected that her boss, Byron, was possessed. Everything started six months ago when her boss's temper worsened significantly after he failed to win a Tony Award. His temper grew increasingly volatile, venting his frustrations on his assistants. Within half a year, he had fired 67 assistants. While David thought Byron's behavior might be the issue, the office lady told everyone that the temperature dropped by 10 degrees whenever her boss entered the office. She even showed them a video, and what was even more bizarre was that her boss was sweating blood from the back of his neck. 
At the same time, Kristen received a phone call. It was a family member from a previous case she had worked on at the attorney's office. After Kristen had left, Townsend had overturned her conclusion and now wanted to imprison the child suspect. Upon arriving at the court and seeing the hypocritical Townsend, Kristen got furious and found the child's lawyer after the court adjourned and volunteered to testify against Townsend in the case. After returning from the court, Kristen went straight to Byron's office. Seeing Kristen's arrival, he urged everyone to proceed with the exorcism ceremony. While Kristen was discussing with Byron, Ben sneaked up behind to observe him. Upon hearing that he would go bald, Byron immediately kicked the trio out of his office. They found the office lady and explained that Byron's sweating blood was due to an infected hairpin and his rage was due to narcissistic personality disorder. However, the office lady didn't believe their theory and showed them real-time surveillance footage of her boss's office. The footage showed Byron trying to break free of his restraints while shouting about killing someone. David went to find a church exorcist to prepare for the exorcism, but was rejected due to lack of evidence. As he was about to leave, he told the exorcist about his recurring hallucinations, and the exorcist asked him to draw what he was seeing. Back at their residence, David started to draw the image of God and a stone door that flashed through his mind. Kristen continued to participate in the trial and, during a recess called by the judge, watched a video about emotional management. Just as Kristen was called to attend the hearing, her former boss and Townsend began their attack. They used stolen medical records from Kristen's doctor to undermine her credibility. Seeing the weeping family members, Kristen became furious once she returned to her car. The next day, the trio confronted Byron again. Seeing him vehemently deny their allegations, Kristen told everyone that Byron was merely using anger management techniques to personify his anger as the victim he claimed to have killed, and there was no demon possession. At this point, Byron declared that they were all dead, leaving everyone stunned. Then he began to call out for the victim and received a response. This further confused the team. Ben discovered that the sound was coming from a smart speaker on the desk. While Kristen and David were interacting with the smart speaker, Ben found through IP tracing that someone was messing around from the coffee shop downstairs. Ben advised Kristen to go to the coffee shop while he would play a high-frequency noise to find the hacker. However, Kristen told him that nothing was going on downstairs. A flustered Ben unplugged the internet cable, but the smart speaker started to make a different strange noise. Back at the church, David played the recorded noise for the priest and told him that his companions were unsure who had hacked the device and how. Ben, not willing to give up, decided to bring the smart speaker home for further study. As Kristen was leaving, she noticed a painting on the table and told David that it looked like da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. After everyone left, David started to search for information about the painting. Upon closer examination, he noticed three strange dots on the painting. Looking at the dots, David referred to a world map. At this moment, he accidentally saw the numbers on the stone door. After converting these numbers to coordinates on the map, he successfully matched the dots on the painting to three locations, Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, Kristen found Townsend. Through a clever conversation, she successfully fished out his real intention. He wanted the child suspect to go to jail. Watching him walk away, Kristen stopped the recording on her phone. Back home, Ben handed over the smart speaker to his sister, who was also a tech expert. Despite her efforts, she found nothing amiss. Just then, their home's smart speaker unexpectedly activated. Ben suggested that the speaker might be hacked by someone like previously. At that moment, they received a message from Kristen, who told him in person that the recording she did was filled with static noise, making Townsend's voice indistinguishable. She asked for help to fix it. In the morning, they told Byron that his smart speaker had been hacked. From the back, they discovered an IT guy named Lewin, who was contracted to maintain their network. While they waited for Lewin, Ben told everyone that if the hacker tried to infiltrate his system again, they would make the hacker pay. He also called Kristen to one side and told her that he couldn't extract the original voice from the recording, but he could artificially synthesize one. Thinking of Townsend, Kristen agreed to Ben's suggestion. When Lewin was called, he admitted to hacking Byron's network, justifying his actions by claiming that his wages had been withheld by him. When Ben asked Lewin how he managed to hack his own devices, Lewin denied it, confessing that he had stopped his hacking activities a few days ago. Upon returning home, Ben saw his sister interacting with the smart speaker, and the conversation mentioned some kids. As Ben tried to ask more, his sister abruptly closed the door in panic. Realizing something was amiss, Ben hurriedly disposed of the smart speaker in the garbage. After the truth was revealed, Byron was no longer irate. 
As the office lady was out helping him call people in for interviews, a message popped up on his computer chat software saying that hell was only half full. The office lady was out, making a thankful call to David. As the two were speaking, Byron suddenly jumped down from the office building. In the courtroom, the child suspect's lawyer presented the synthesized recording that Ben helped with. Thanks to the recording, Kristen defeated Townsend. As Kristen was leaving, she ignored him muttering about demons. The scene then shifts to David bringing Kristen and Ben to a residence for their new mission. Upon entering, they found all the furniture locked up. The parents led them to a locked room. Inside, they met their subject for evaluation, a boy named Eric. It turned out a few days ago, Eric bit his sister because her laughter while watching cartoons was too loud and disturbed him. During the conversation with Eric, Ben scraped off some material from a pipe for further investigation. Upon arriving in the living room, Eric's parents shared with everyone that their whole family moved to this place two years ago. Since then, Eric's personality had undergone a change. Over the past two years, they had conducted 12 psychological tests for him, and the psychologist had prescribed at least 23 different types of medication. Initially, some of them had an effect, but as time went on, Eric developed drug resistance. Subsequently, Eric was sent to a mental hospital twice, and the police were even called to his school three times. Eventually, even a federal program returned him a week after taking him in. In the end, Eric's parents had no choice but to wonder if Eric was possessed by a demon. As they left, David shared with everyone that when they entered the house, they noticed Eric's sister's hair had a greenish tinge. Eric's strange behavior also only started after they moved here. Coupled with the discovery of a large amount of metal particles scraped off from a pipe, they had reason to suspect that Eric's mental symptoms might be due to excessive copper intake. Just as they were about to go back for testing, Kristen called out to Ben, hoping he could also come to her house to help check. Since she had work to do, she had to ask her mother to help take care of her kids. Moreover, as her mother couldn't remember whose birthday it was, she bought two pairs of AR glasses as gifts. Upon returning to the bedroom, they started playing a horror game. Once they began the game, faces of spiders, bloody butchers, and ogres immediately appeared. Just as the little daughter was screaming in fright, Kristen came home in time and took off the AR glasses, allowing the little girl to regain her composure. As Kristen was checking what had frightened her daughter, the kids switched to a bunny-hitting game. The next day, Eric arrived at the church and started doing the tests set by Kristen. Compared to her test, Eric preferred David's interviewing style. During their conversation, David told Eric that the best way to have God realize one's wishes is to have faith and take actual actions. Eric also talked about his future dream of becoming a cartoonist. As requested, Ben came to Kristen's house later to help check. After saying hello briefly, the mischievous kids started playing the horror game again. Just as the eldest daughter defeated the monster according to the game's guide, the device indicated that it was connected to the internet. At the same time, a player named Ross asked to join the game. The kids agreed to the invitation without much thinking. Upon arriving in the hallway, they saw the girl Ross, who asked the kids to go to the corner of their mother's room and touch a board. As they entered the room, Ross didn't seem like a simple player. Upon reaching the corner, she began to entice them to join her in playing the next level of the game. At the same time, Ben, who was inspecting the pipes, heard the kids chatter and promptly interrupted their game to see for himself. This led to a discovery which he shared with Kristen when she returned. Ben informed her that the kids were playing a horror game. To prevent them from continuing this, Kristen asked Ben to add a child lock to the device. As Ben was doing this, Ross emerged to scare him, but Ben was unfazed by Ross's threats and pressed the confirmation button. Meanwhile, Eric's mother found Eric kneeling beside his bed, praying fervently. The next morning, Eric was like a transformed person. He took the initiative to tidy up the lawn and did his homework diligently, asking his mother to check it. Seeing Eric behaving like a normal child, his mother called David to express gratitude and let David know that Eric wanted someone to teach him how to draw comics. David offered to teach Eric the basics. After hanging up the phone, David, armed with his drawing tools, rushed to Eric's house. As Eric was praying for God to fulfill his wishes, David saw a baby sinking in the pool. The baby was Eric's little sister. When David confronted Eric about what happened, Eric emotionlessly told him that he did it to make God fulfill his wish to take the child away. Upon hearing Eric's words, David sat down in shock. 
Back at the church, David and Kristen immediately sought an exorcist, hoping to perform an exorcism on Eric as soon as possible. The exorcism was scheduled for the following day. Later, as Kristen's daughter was sleeping, the AR glasses activated on their own. The eldest daughter, who put on the glasses, saw Ross, who had been erased by Ben. When Ross tried to entice them to unlock the child lock and was declined, she mentioned their father. The daughters, concerned, asked Ross about their father's whereabouts. The game board displayed the word heaven, which frightened the daughters, and they ran to their mother's room. To reassure them, Kristen told them that their father sends daily messages to assure them of his safety. She and her daughters then sent a message to their father. The next afternoon, the exorcist and David arrived at Eric's house only to see a police car parked outside. Eric's mother opened the door and told everyone that Eric had disappeared. Simultaneously, Eric's father was telling the police that he didn't know whose blood was inside the house. Seeing Kristen's gaze, Eric's mother told everyone that she had to do something for the sake of her other children. This revelation made everyone realize that Eric's parents had killed Eric. Back at the church, David began to pray for Eric's family. Kristen, upon returning home and hearing her daughter say goodbye, broke down crying in the kitchen. The scene shifts to David calling his partner Ben, hoping he could come back to deal with some demon-related issues. It turns out that a case they handled three months ago has resurfaced with some complications. However, Ben informs him that he's currently tied up with a ghost-hunting TV show and suggests David should turn to Kristen for help. Kristen is at home preparing for Halloween with her daughters. After receiving David's call, she's told that they need to reassess the situation as their four-day exorcism effort has had no effect. Kristen tells David to contact her again in an hour. Meanwhile, Kristen's mother is on a date at a restaurant, but the man can't stop hiccuping. She tries a folk remedy to scare the hiccups away, but it doesn't work. To ease his embarrassment, the man excuses himself to the restroom. Seeing her date leave, Townsend at the next table starts to strike up a conversation with Kristen's mother. At this moment, she receives a call from Kristen who briefly explains the situation. The mother agrees to help look after the kids. After the call ends, Townsend seizes his opportunity and starts flirting. When Kristen's mother seems hesitant, he plays hard to get, telling her he'd wait for her at the street corner for 10 minutes. It's up to her whether she comes or not. After that, Kristen's mother, unable to resist the temptation, finds him and they share a passionate kiss but without using their tongues. After this smelly encounter, Kristen's mother arrives at Kristen's house to help look after her children. Seeing her mother's radiant happiness, Kristen suspects her mom was getting high and dry with a man. Kristen then meets up with David. Before entering the room, they hear a woman inside throwing things and growling. Kristen puts on sunglasses and enters the room. Suddenly, a woman named Caroline begs Kristen to save her. Unfamiliar with such a situation, Kristen leaves the room and asks David for Caroline's psychological evaluation report. David informs her that five different doctors have given five different diagnoses. Having seen the report, Kristen suggests that they should find a non-Catholic doctor for treatment. She then makes a call to a psychologist she knows to ask for help. After Kristen leaves, a little girl named Brenda, also wearing a mask, arrives at Kristen's house for the Halloween party. After a brief greeting, Brenda diverts the conversation from her mask to a ghost story to capture the children's interest. She tells a tale of a naughty little girl who was locked in a room by her parents. In their anger, the parents plan to burn their disobedient child alive. Despite the girl managing to escape, she gets severely burned by the hot bars of a fence. Brenda abruptly ends the story there and suggests the kids join her in doing something even scarier. In the basement, Brenda asks the kids to discuss how they would kill their own mothers. When someone suggests poison, Brenda tells them she knows a great place to hide a body. She shines her flashlight to one side, illuminating a large hole. Seeing this, one of Kristen's daughters gets scared and decides to leave. Meanwhile, Ben, who is participating in a TV show with a ghost hunting team, begins their ghost hunting endeavor. During filming, a painting on the wall mysteriously falls. Ben quickly explains the phenomenon scientifically, which leaves the program crew without a response, forcing them into a break. During the intermission, Ben strikes up a conversation with Vanessa, a team member who believes in science. They discuss supernatural phenomena, and Ben mentions the story of a girl being revived. Seeing Ben's confusion, Vanessa stops him, revealing that the others were sneakily recording his comments, which annoys Ben. 
After the break, the ghost hunting team moves to their second location. Seizing an opportunity when others leave, Ben reveals some of his affectionate thoughts to Vanessa. Just then, a ghostly figure appears at the end of the corridor. Ben, confirming that Vanessa isn't teasing him, starts to investigate. Suddenly, a chicken scream is heard from afar. He follows the chicken noises, and upon arrival, everyone has a nosebleed. After sending Vanessa out, they discuss the recent ghostly figure. Once Ben confirms that Vanessa wasn't playing a prank on him, he returns to the previous location and finally finds the plausible cause. A team member had secretly placed a projector at the end of the corridor, using a chemical spray that induced nosebleeds and allergic reactions to create a ghostly apparition. After solving this fake paranormal incident, Ben finds Vanessa and suggests that they continue chatting via a messaging app, but Vanessa leaves her contact information instead. On the other hand, the psychologist that Kristen called arrives at their residence. As the psychologist observes the exorcism, Caroline tells David that the vision she saw earlier was not heaven, but hell, and the three stars belong to hell. The psychologist also informs everyone that according to the symptoms, Caroline appears to have schizophrenia, not demonic possession. They suggest sending Caroline to the hospital immediately for treatment. However, David, knowing that what Caroline just said are things he had experienced, chooses not to believe in science this time. As the psychologist complains about how to get the church to believe in science, Kristen sees the exorcism tools nearby. She then goes to the bathroom and replaces the holy water with tap water. Back in the room, when the exorcist sprinkles tap water on Caroline and she reacts the same way, Kristen reveals that she had replaced the holy water with tap water. A heated argument then ensues between the two factions. The science believers suggest sending Caroline to the hospital immediately and question why tap water would have the same effect. However, the exorcist from the church faction claims that due to his strong faith, the tap water could be transformed into holy water upon his touch. Amidst the argument, Caroline's husband sides with the church and hopes to continue the exorcism, but he also requests that the science faction stand by to call the hospital when necessary. As Kristen watches the exorcism, she receives a call from her mother. It turns out that Kristen's mother just received a call from Brenda's parent saying Brenda couldn't attend Kristen's Halloween party due to illness. Kristen's mother is taken aback. When she goes downstairs to check on her granddaughters, she is told that the other children have gone to the graveyard with a girl pretending to be Brenda. Kristen rushes to the graveyard in a panic. Upon arrival at the graveyard, the fake Brenda has the children play a funeral game with her. In front of an open grave, she instructs Kristen's youngest daughter to lie inside. When the oldest daughter questions why Brenda isn't going inside, the fake Brenda says that she needs to finish the naughty little girl's story. Meanwhile in the room, Caroline was tied to the bed. David took over the work of the exorcist. Looking at Caroline, whose eyes were red, David told her that the three stars she mentioned earlier were sent by heaven to deal with the demons, and that the same 60 devil sigils were useless. Just as Caroline warned David of danger and that they were targeting him, David acknowledged it. Subsequently, Caroline calmed down. The sober Caroline was concerned about where her husband was. On the other side, while the youngest daughter was lying in the cemetery, the fake Brenda started the rest of the naughty little girl's story. The girl had never left home since she was burned. The only time she could go out to play was Halloween night. As she slowly removed her mask, Kristen arrived. The mischievous kids all ran towards their mother upon hearing her shout. After Kristen pulled out her youngest daughter and asked where the fake Brenda was, only a mask was left in the cemetery. The scene then shifts to David, who had received a new task early in the morning. He took everyone to meet a woman named Grace. The church suspected her to be a prophet. Upon reaching the location, they saw Grace giving a prophecy to a woman. After that, David asked about her conversations with God. But hearing her response, David, who felt Grace was like a charlatan, asked what God expected of him. Grace picked up a balloon from the ground, blew it up a few times, and told David that he would be in danger soon. She also mentioned David's hallucinations and reminded Kristen to avoid red color for the next seven days. When David asked why she blew up the balloon, Grace told them that doing so made God's words clearer. Hearing this explanation, the skeptical trio reported this to the bishop. David asked why they needed to evaluate Grace, but was told by the bishop to just ensure she had predictive abilities. They would discuss other details after confirmation. The following day, Kristen and David saw breaking news. Apparently a huge hole appeared in the Queens district the previous day. The homeowner who was able to escape was the woman who had spoken to Grace yesterday. 
Immediately, David called Ben to his room and started a video conference. Ben, the atheist, always believed that this was not a prediction, but that some people are naturally intuitive. However, no matter how he explained it, David still suggested they visit Grace again. As Kristen was preparing to leave, she saw her daughter wearing a red coat. Recalling the prophet's words from yesterday, Kristen asked her daughter to take off her red coat. Upon arriving at the kindergarten, Kristen asked Grace to cooperate with her on some true or false questions. During this time, almost as if guided by a supernatural force, Kristen inquired about her youngest daughter's heart condition. After blowing up a balloon, Grace confidently assured Kristen that her daughter would be okay. However, Kristen felt that Grace was messing with her and lost her temper. As Grace was consoling Kristen, she suddenly seemed to hear something and moved to a table to start drawing unknown patterns. The group returned to the bishop with the drawing. While Ben and Kristen reported their assessment and questioned why they were so invested in it, the bishop revealed that the request came from the Vatican. It turned out that Grace had recited a prophecy from the Povelia Codex, written in 1550. Even more astonishing was that there is only one copy of this book worldwide, and its existence is unknown to the public. Only the Pope knew its contents. The bishop then instructed David to take the copy back and translate it. The next day, David invited Grace to his residence and showed her his drawing of three stars. Grace told David that the three stars represented the Holy Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When David asked why the three stars appeared on the earth, Grace told him that the sphere in the drawing was not the earth, and the stars did not belong to a cone, but an Euler triangle. After researching and using hallucinogenic mushrooms to help visualize, David saw the Euler triangle that Grace was talking about. At that moment, Kristen found David and revealed that the patterns Grace had drawn could be used to fill in the missing parts of the Paviglia Codex. Seeing David in a daze, Kristen decided to discuss it in detail the next day. After Kristen left, David saw a shadowy figure. When Kristen got home, her mother informed her that she had invited her new boyfriend over for dinner and was currently upstairs playing with the kids. When Kristen went upstairs and saw the new boyfriend was her enemy Townsend, she was instantly infuriated. As Townsend tried to greet her, Kristen dragged him out and insisted they talk in her studio. On the way there, Kristen made sure to bring her knife. Once in the office, Kristen held the knife to his throat. Just as Townsend tried to say something, Kristen made a small cut and told him that if he didn't go to the hospital within 20 minutes, he could be doomed. Holding his wound, Townsend had no choice but to head to the hospital. Kristen returned home and threw away the gifts from Townsend. Dinner ruined, Kristen could only make do with pizza for herself and her daughters. She then noticed a notebook, presumably a gift from Townsend. After flipping through it, she saw a pattern and immediately confiscated all the notebooks and brought them back to her room for closer inspection. After confirming there was nothing else, Kristen put them all in her wardrobe. In the morning, the group told the archbishop about the secret they had discovered. After translation, it was revealed that the Poveglia Codex didn't predict the demise of Catholicism, but the end of the world. Unable to sit still, the archbishop immediately sent the group to find Grace and complete the rest of the fragmented codex. Kristen returned home and played the recording of her defeating Townsend to her mother, sternly telling her to stop dating her enemy. After regrouping, they arrived at the kindergarten, only to be told that Grace had been taken away by immigration due to her expired immigrant status. Upon arriving at the Immigration Bureau, David posed as a lawyer to see Grace. With only five minutes allowed for the visit, Grace started drawing according to Codex. However, she was only able to draw a few pictures before being taken away by the officers due to the time limit. The officer promised to hand over the drawings to David but threw them all away in the trash after Grace left. In the evening, Townsend found Kristen's mother, but she officially broke up with Townsend. Seizing the opportunity, Townsend asked for a farewell kiss. However, the tongueless kiss led to them ending up in bed. Just as they were celebrating their love, fire broke out under the fishy bed. After a night of passion, Kristen's mother woke up and took out the only red dress from the wardrobe. The scene then shifts to the Prophet Grace being taken away by the Immigration Bureau after she drew the patterns that could just fill the missing parts of the Pavalia Codex. However, the Vatican Church didn't believe in the existence of prophets, so they sent a high-ranking official over for assessment. Kristen told the official that she was once a Catholic believer, but now believes in science. And Ben, a Muslim, didn't want to converse with the church people at all. Unable to reach an agreement, they had to find David for consultation. 
After learning about the official's approach, David threw a tantrum. Just as David's team was preparing to leave, they were called into the office by the archbishop, who asked them to assess a woman named Bridget. After losing her own baby in her stomach, she started having convulsions and making strange sounds, claiming she killed a young child. After hearing the report, Kristen told the archbishop that it was just a split personality. However, the archbishop insisted it was demonic possession. Even if it involved murder, it was the work of the devil. Therefore, they were asked to investigate whether Bridget was really possessed. Given it was a murder case, Kristen shared it with her friend Mira from the homicide department. As Kristen detailed the case, Mira was shocked because the police hadn't released this information. She also told Kristen that it wasn't just one case, but three. Although there were no formal charges, they all had a common point. Before disappearing, the victims all got into a red car and received prank calls after disappearing. After saying goodbye to Mira, Kristen arrived at Bridget's residence and shared the information she gathered with David and Ben. While the husband, Dwight, was away visiting his wife, Ben and Kristen spotted a red car in the garage and concluded that it was the murder case caused by split personality. In the room, David also shared that the demon had introduced itself. Bridget confessed to killing the young child while looking at Kristen and mentioned that to prevent the young child from being alone, she also murdered two other children. Eventually, Kristen managed to provoke Bridget into revealing the other children's names and where their bodies were buried. After that, Bridget lunged at Kristen, attempting to bite her. Upon returning to the church, the trio met again with the official from the Vatican. David convinced the official to let them see the complete Poveglia Codex. While browsing it, Kristen discovered something. The official told them that they hadn't been able to translate this part, but they knew it was a hierarchy chart. While everyone was discussing what Grace could have drawn, Ben mentioned that the detention center had surveillance cameras, which might have recorded what Grace drew. As Ben was trying to access the footage, Kristen checked the hierarchy chart and noticed a symbol that seemed familiar. She quickly took a picture of it with her phone. Returning home, Kristen found a notebook in her wardrobe that Townsend had given to her daughters. Upon comparing, she found the symbol was the same. She called David and informed him that this was drawn by Townsend. Given Townsend's sleazy demeanor, the two began a search and found that the symbol corresponded to a high-ranking demon with 30 minion demons under its control. These demons feed on human sins and lies, which give them power and influence. Kristen asked David if they could conclude that Townsend was a psychopath, to which David reluctantly agreed to prevent further differences in opinions. On Townsend's side, he was targeting the IT guy Lewin. Just as Lewin was rejected by his favorite girl after confessing his feelings, Townsend approached him, encouraged him, and invited him over. Seeing that Lewin was avoiding women on the street, Townsend advised him to follow his lead and demonstrated his approach. Frustrated due to his being rejected, Lewin sought out Townsend later. When he expressed a desire to change coffee shops to avoid awkwardness, Townsend bluntly called Lewin a loser. Seeing his denial, Townsend knew he was on the right track and started to manipulate Lewin, encouraging him to take revenge on the girl. So Lewin prepared a surprise in the bathroom and sent it to the girl, which made her sick. Lewin, now in line with Townsend's suggestions, found Townsend again, who then introduced him to a group and suggested getting to know them. Once home, Lewin started a group video call, while Townsend on the other side was observing everything through his tablet. Over at Kristen's, while she and David were in discussion, Mira also dropped by. Seeing her friend there, David took his leave. Mira then shared the cases of the three children with Kristen, hoping she could assist the police with the investigation. Arriving at Bridget's home, Kristen aimed to have her confess to premeditated murder, but her intent was discovered. Bridget began muttering to herself. Once she was calm, Bridget told David that the demon had left. As David was asking if she intended to continue killing, Bridget grimaced in pain and eventually passed out. After leaving Bridget, Kristen arrived at the meeting point that Bridget had first mentioned. Taking in the scene before her, she called her friend Mira from the homicide department, but didn't reveal who the murderer was, only mentioning the potential location where the bodies might be hidden. Since Ben had obtained some surveillance footage, Kristen and David returned to the church to watch it with everyone else. After viewing the footage, the group began to search for clues in the Pavalia Codex. Seeing the Vatican officials' reluctance to share a copy, David pulled them aside, allowing Kristen to stealthily take a picture. Everyone rushed over when they heard that Bridget had regained consciousness. However, this time Bridget was speaking in Latin, saying that the demon would bring seven worse demons back. The group realized that Bridget's husband, Dwight, was missing from the room. Ben had gone out to look for him and overheard Dwight making a phone call. Seeing Dwight return to his room, Ben redialed the number, only to find that it was to the police station. 
Just then, Mira arrived at the scene with the police. As Bridget was taken away, Ben summoned everyone back to their residence. Once back, Ben shared what he had just witnessed. Combining this with what Mira had told her, Kristen began to suspect that Dwight was the murderer. She mentioned a psychological concept called coercive control, where a guilty husband makes his spouse take the blame for his crimes. David agreed with Kristen's theory and returned to Bridget's home only to find her husband Dwight sorting through the victim's belongings. At that moment, Dwight grabbed a dagger from the floor and lunged at David. After incapacitating Dwight, David found a new mark on a wooden board. Back at their place, while David was showing everyone the new mark he had found, he saw another familiar mark. This mark appeared in his father's sketchbook. To understand the reason, David and Kristen decided to visit David's father, Leon's house. Ben was not present because he was participating in the post-production dubbing work for the last ghost hunting TV show. Leon lived in a remote place. After greeting them, Leon told Kristen he would paint her a red t-shirt as a gift. At the same time, he introduced David to his wife, Esther. While David was surprised to learn that his new mother was six months pregnant, another woman's voice called out from a distance. This woman was also David's new mother. David and Kristen were baffled, but they were soon invited to participate in a ceremony to summon ancestors that night. Inside the house, Kristen began to gossip about Leon's marital status. Just as she was marveling at how the three could coexist peacefully, she started feeling dizzy. Esther informed Kristen that the wine she had just drunk contained a type of hallucinogenic mushroom. As she was showing Kristen the pottery jug containing the wine, Kristen noticed a demonic symbol on it. She became concerned about why the symbol appeared on the pottery jug. Leon's other wife explained that the symbol on Leon's painting was inspired by them. While everyone was preparing for the ceremony, David and Leon went to the studio. After congratulating his father on having two wives, David asked why the symbol in the painting only started appearing three years ago. He also asked what happened to his father three years ago. Leon told him that since meeting his two wives three years ago, he was filled with inspiration as if he was reborn. David felt that his father's two wives were not simple people. As everyone was enjoying the pre-ceremony party, Kristen saw David returning from the studio. When she learned that it was Esther who invited Leon to the ceremony, Kristen suggested they should pay more attention to her. On Ben's side, after he finished his recording, he ran into his longed-for Vanessa. Vanessa began to complain about him, wondering why he hadn't contacted her since they last parted. Ben told her that he had called her three times after they separated, but no one answered. Looking at the saved number, Vanessa told him that it was not her number because some of the digits were reversed. She also suggested that they should have a good talk after she finished recording. Later, Vanessa discovered that the sound engineer intentionally raised Ben's pitch. She angrily deleted all the recordings and left the recording studio with Ben. In the evening, Leon and his family were preparing for their summoning ceremony. Amidst the dance, Kristen's phone rang, the caller being a man named Andy. It turns out, Andy is Kristen's husband, who happened to return from a mountain climbing trip that day. Finding the house empty, he noticed that the lights in Kristen's office were on and the door was slightly ajar. He walked in, only to find his mother-in-law and Townsend cooking. After tending to the kids, the mother-in-law took Andy aside, hoping he would help keep this secret. When Andy found that no one answered his calls, he had to put the kids to bed himself. Seeing that their daddy hadn't returned for a long time, the kids told him about the recent happenings, including the AR glasses game. Subsequently, their second daughter asked her father to help them get rid of the monsters in the game. Andy, wearing the glasses, easily defeated the monsters in Kristen's room. He also saw Ross. When Ross started threatening, Andy, along with his daughter, walked straight through and wrote goodbye on the chessboard. Meanwhile, at Leon's place, Kristen excused herself to maintain sobriety. David stepped outside for some fresh air and cleared his head. At that moment, he heard a painful scream from the fields. Following the sound, Kristen found Esther lying on the ground, showing signs of a premature birth. As Kristen's 911 call failed due to lack of signal, Esther gave birth to a baby. The sight of the newborn terrified Kristen, causing her to flee the scene. However, this sight might be caused by the hallucinogenic wine she had drunk earlier. Left by Kristen, David encountered a woman named Annie. He noticed scars on her arm while watching her dance. When David expressed concern about her not being afraid of being stepped on, Annie asked whether he believed in ghosts. Hearing David's affirmation, Annie left the house. 
Seeking Annie, David went to Leon's studio. Leon became curious about the Annie mentioned by David. After he described what Annie looked like, a shocked Leon revealed that Annie was their ancestor. He then produced a letter, which turned out to be a purchase certificate for Annie by a slave owner. The scar on her arm was from a whip, inflicted while she was resisting having her child taken away. Confused, David saw a demonic symbol on the back of the letter. Leon explained that it was the mark of the slave owner, and he included it in his paintings to constantly remind himself to resist slavery. Hearing his father's words, David understood the heavy responsibility his father bore. Later, David also received a call from Ben. When Ben and Vanessa returned home and were in the midst of a passionate kiss, Ben became tangled with why Vanessa had given him a fake number. Vanessa explained that after her sister's death, her spirit had possessed her right arm, and the fake number was to prevent herself from being taken advantage of. This was a concept the scientifically-minded Ben struggled to accept, leading to an argument between them. Just as Vanessa was preparing to show him the door, Ben developed a desire for Vanessa's body. In a bid to justify his actions, Ben told David about Vanessa's possession by her sister. But David jokingly retorted that he encountered a ghost who had been dead for over 160 years. He also told Ben that the world was already strange enough. After wrapping up their affairs, David and Kristen hired a driver to take them home. As David and Kristen were saying their goodbyes, her husband Andy, who had put their daughter to bed, appeared at the door. The reunited couple share a passionate kiss, but without using their tongues. After months of not seeing each other, the two certainly have a lot to share. Later in the night, a strange noise echoes through the house. Everyone tracks the noise to a room where they find a small orange cat. However, the cat's gaze at Kristen is eerily unsettling. The next morning, David visits Kristen and shows her the subpoena he received. It turns out to be Caroline, the patient who was supposed to be possessed and exercised previously. Now, she has recovered her senses and is suing David and the church. She believes that the exorcism was nonsense and that she should have been taken to a psychiatrist directly. As David tried to confirm the events of the day of the exorcism, Kristen ended the conversation and told him that what they needed to do now was to negotiate with the lawyer assigned by the church. Only then would they avoid accusations of colluding testimonies from Caroline's lawyer. David had no choice but to leave. At this moment, the orange cat that Andy temporarily placed in the studio meowed loudly again, staring at Kristen with its strange gaze. Back at his residence, David met the newly assigned bishop, who also informed David that the Vatican was taking their work seriously. When the lawsuit was mentioned, the bishop introduced David to René, who volunteered to act as David's mediator lawyer. René had a special relationship with David since she was the sister of David's deceased girlfriend. During the deposition, the plaintiff played the recording of the exorcism. Caroline also stated that she had suffered from anxiety, depression, and even suicidal thoughts a week after the exorcism. Her psychiatrist also pointed out that Caroline was suffering from a mental disorder and had prescribed her two types of mental health medication. Outside the deposition room, Kristen and Ben, after hearing the plaintiff's lawyer's damning evidence about David's past before becoming a priest, decided they had to find a way to help David get through this. With the first deposition ending in a total defeat, René, back at the church, informed everyone that the plaintiff demanded an eight million settlement and David's dismissal from his position. A deeply affected David returned to his residence, where René came to find him. René confessed that she had been in love with David for a long time, but due to her sister's relationship, she hadn't expressed her feelings. Now that her sister is gone like ashes, she should take the initiative. She voiced her intentions to find David for some intimate time, but was turned down by him, citing his need to study, thus rejecting Renee's request. Kristen and Andy began discussing David's evidence-gathering meeting during the day. As Kristen was telling her husband about the two types of medication the psychiatrist had prescribed for Caroline, she realized something was amiss. She directly called Ben to help with some investigation. Early in the morning, Kristen summoned Renee and told her about the evidence-gathering meeting, where they planned to counterattack on the grounds of the opponent's unscientific drug use. Upon arriving at the meeting, Renee immediately counterattacked on the issue of medication. It turned out that both drugs prescribed by Caroline's psychiatrist had side effects, causing dizziness, nausea, and suicidal tendencies. At the same time, Kristen's doctor also told everyone that there was another type of medication that could treat the symptoms, but it was more expensive. 
In addition, Caroline's psychiatrist had been using an unapproved treatment for her recovery, leaving the plaintiff's lawyer defenseless. In the end, Caroline agreed to settle out of court, but her medical expenses would have to be paid by the church. After the matter was resolved, David returned to his residence. But this time, Renee arrived at the room earlier than David and had already changed her clothes. She also told David that she would not leave unless they did something that day. On the other side, Kristen returned home to find a gift box. As she opened the gift box, Andy told her that he hoped she could replace him in the next Everest climb, while he would take good care of their daughters at home. The story certainly doesn't end here. Townsend, who didn't cause trouble in the previous episode, must be up to something big in this one. The brainwashed Lewin found Townsend again. Upon seeing Lewin on the way, Townsend came to his side and posed with a gun gesture, suggesting that Lewin go to the women's gym and use this pose to take out the women there. The brainwashed Lewin really went to the gym to flex his muscles and began to imitate shooting. After returning from the gym, Lewin told Townsend that the method was exciting. Townsend then began further indoctrination. When he heard that Lewin had bought a real gun and wanted to learn shooting, Townsend called in a sharpshooter to train him. He also told Lewin that the sharpshooter, a member of the Devil's 60 group, was one of the 59 people he trusted most in the world. After some basic shooting training, Lewin was summoned by Townsend to carry out his first mission, targeting the prayer group members of the church where David resided. Returning home, Lewin started to get excited with his real gun, but accidentally shot himself. Seeing the news, Townsend was so angry that he turned over the table. After venting his emotions, he began to look for new candidates on the internet to continue the chaos. Early in the morning, Kristen and her team arrived at a school to address a problem along with the bishop. Several students of the school had suddenly begun to hum a tune and had been at it for two hours. They would only pause momentarily when their teacher called them, only to resume humming soon after. To understand the reason, Kristen had the students stop humming and had them sing jingle bells with her. Seeing that they could all sing the lyrics, Kristen let them sing it again. However, the students began to sing jingle bells in the tune of the song they were previously humming. Kristen informed everyone that these students might have caught a mental illness called earworm, an auditory form of obsessive-compulsive disorder. For now, she had them chew gum to distract their attention. To understand why the song became so addictive, Kristen hummed the song while lying on her bed. Her daughter told Kristen that the song was called Fat Christmas and had become a viral hit online. Knowing the song's name, Kristen looked up the original video on her laptop but found it quite bewitching. The next day, Kristen shared the clues she had found with everyone. While they didn't think there was any harm, the bishop led everyone to a shocking scene. The four humming students from before had turned into a choir. Back at the church, the bishop questioned everyone on how the song could spread to 50 students in just one day. Kristen suggested it might be mass hysteria, citing the laughter epidemic that happened in Tanzania in 1962 and the dancing plague of 1518. After hearing this, the bishop started wondering whether an exorcism was necessary. Ben, who believes in science, suggested checking for asbestos poisoning in the school. At this moment, Kristen received a message from her husband, Andy. Back home, Kristen called her quarreling daughter to her bedroom. The daughter told them that she learned her aggressive behavior from her grandmother. When she got home the previous day, she had told her grandmother about being pushed down, and her grandmother told her she must fight back to prevent further bullying. So she followed her grandmother's advice today, and it worked quite well. Kristen then confronted her own mother. However, her mother denied teaching her granddaughter to fight and stressed that she could never do such a thing. Kristen, looking at her mother, believed her words. Meanwhile, David at the church called Ben to help investigate whether the strange occurrences at the school were related to asbestos poisoning. When David returned to his room, he found a card on his pillow. He immediately called lawyer Renee, and they started talking about the card's content, which was about David's deceased girlfriend. Needless to say, their conversation didn't end well. The next morning, the group returned to the school for further investigation, and were told by Ben that there were no issues with asbestos. The problem was with the students' food, as the vegetables had pesticide residues. While they were discussing this, the girls who were humming before suddenly started to hurt themselves with sharp objects. While Kristen and the others were trying to prevent the girls from hurting themselves, Kristen's daughter started blaming her grandmother when she saw her entering the house. Seeing her granddaughter's emotional outburst, the grandmother told her that the world is full of lies and advised her to just lie next time she encounters such a situation. She can say anything as long as she places herself outside of the situation, but snitching is absolutely unacceptable. At this moment, Kristen's mother received a phone call from Townsend. 
After hearing that she was acting according to his wishes, he happily hung up the phone. In the infirmary, Kristen encountered several girls who had self-harmed. During their conversation, she discovered that these students hadn't eaten any of the vegetables served at school. Since pesticide poisoning was ruled out, Kristen investigated their search history. She found that they all enjoyed watching videos by a beauty influencer named Marinda. Knowing the name, the group back at the church searched for Marinda, only to find a 95-minute long makeup tutorial video where Marinda claimed that anyone who watched it till the end and said Marinda challenge three times would go mad. At this moment, David noticed that the background music of the video was the same fat Christmas song. The atheist Ben volunteered to tackle the 95-minute video. Kristen, not entirely convinced, also started watching the video at home, with the volume turned up to maximum. At this point, her sleeping daughters woke up and claimed to hear a man's voice. Even more unnerving was that after Kristen recited Marinda Challenge three times at the end of the video, her daughters in the bedroom began to do the same. Meanwhile, after reciting the words three times, David received a message on his phone. It's a photo of him and Renee being intimate, with the sender seemingly only 50 feet away. He spotted a shadowy figure outside the window, but when he rushed out, he saw nothing. At the same time, Renee, who had received the same message, called David. After confirming it wasn't a prank by David, they realized something was off. The next morning, Kristen was awakened by her daughter's calls and rushed to the bedroom, only to see one of her daughters trying to pierce her own ears with an object. David and Ben arrived and comforted them, and Ben told everyone that the video contained a high-frequency sound that only teenagers under 16 could hear, encouraging them to terminate themselves. Knowing that, Kristen asked her daughters what they heard, but the girls told her that a voice was continuously asking them if they wanted to join the army to fight others. To prevent the video from spreading, Kristen and the others visited Marinda's home and demanded that she take down the video. When Marinda heard that they might call the police, she sought help from Townsend, who gave Marinda an even worse idea. This indicates that Townsend was the mastermind behind all of these. Back at the church, the trio saw Marinda's latest apology video, in which she promised to delete the 95-minute video and urged everyone not to download or share it. Seeing the content of the apology, the trio realized that the video would be downloaded and shared frenziedly, and it was too late to stop it. That evening, David went to the confessional and confessed about his relationship with Renee and his ongoing priest studies to the priest. After receiving forgiveness, David left the church, only to be attacked by a mysterious person with a knife. In the struggle, David was unfortunately stabbed. Just as he was about to pass out, Kristen's call came through. David was hospitalized. Kristen and Ben rushed to the hospital where they encountered an unreliable detective handling the case. Kristen promptly called in her detective friend, Mira, to take over. In her notes, Mira found that David had been repeatedly muttering the name Ghana during his transport to the hospital. Hearing the name, Ben told everyone that Ghana was a key figure in a possession case they had handled before. Ben suggested they contact their former teammate Judy to confirm whether it was indeed a case of possession. Like Kristen, Judy was also a psychologist. In the middle of the night, David was awakened by the cries of a patient named Harlan from the bed next to him, who had had his lower limbs amputated. Just as David was about to call the nurse, Harlan stopped him with terror in his eyes, warning him that the nurse on duty named Linda was also known as the Plague Nurse. She was prejudiced against people of color and was known to torment patients to death during her shifts. She would even keep the deceased patient's wristbands as her trophies. As David looked on in shock, Nurse Linda arrived at his bedside. After some basic care, she injected David with a tranquilizer. When she asked him about his level of pain, he said it was a nine. After Linda left, Harlan revealed to David that she had not written nine as his pain level, but rather two. When Linda returned to the ward, Harlan lied, saying that he hoped David would recover soon, and the nurse began to inquire about David's pain level. When he complained about his pain, she gave him another injection. The two doses of tranquilizer in quick succession caused David to hallucinate, seeing the prophet Grace who reassured David that God was with him and he had nothing to fear. The prophet reminded David to recall the content of Matthew 13, 25 and the Euler Triangle. However, the prophet was attacked by a demon-like figure interrupting their conversation. Startled awake, David saw Linda murdering Harlan. After everything had quieted down, Linda cut off Harlan's wristband and came to David's bedside to inject another dose of tranquilizer. In the morning, Kristen and Ben found their former teammate Judy. They briefly explained David's attack and then began asking about Ghana. 
When Kristen suggested that Ghana might have PTSD, Judy disagreed, suggesting they should go and talk to Ghana's roommate. However, they decided to visit David in the hospital first. When David woke up, he saw Harlan, who had previously been killed by the nurse, alive and well with both his legs intact in the ward. Harlan advised David to pull out his IV and take oral medication instead to avoid overdosing on tranquilizers. David followed the advice, but that triggered an alarm, and Nurse Linda hastily reinserted the IV, ignoring David's request for oral medication. When Linda met Kristen and the others who were coming to visit David, she used the excuse that David was not lucid. Mira, using her police authority, blocked Linda's other excuses. However, to prevent David from speaking out, Linda injected a sedative into his IV bag before anyone else arrived. Seeing David in a dazed state, everyone else decided to wait until he was more lucid before questioning him. After everyone left, Linda gave David another dose of tranquilizer. In the middle of the night, David saw a demon-like figure appearing in the corridor again. This time, under the guise of taking Harlan for a medical check, the figure took Harlan away. In a panic, Harlan told David that this was a black mass, a ritual of sacrificing animals to encourage demons after the mass. Watching Harlan being wheeled away, David frantically pressed the nurse call button. Just then, the prophet Grace appeared before David again. Seeing David's panic, she told him that the nurse would change shifts at noon the next day and that he should ask the oncoming nurse for an oral tranquilizer. The prophet also told David that what he saw might not be the truth and what he dreamed might not be false. She then emphasized again the content of Matthew 13:25. Comforted by the prophet, David finally fell asleep. The next day, Judy led the team to find Ghana's roommate. The roommate told them he wanted to help Ghana, but Ghana began to take drugs and even attacked him while he was asleep. He had also stolen his game design, the same horror game previously played by Kristen's daughter. Ghana even played the character of Ross 390 in the game. To lure Ghana out, David and his team returned to Kristen's studio and started playing the AR game. While they were waiting for Ghana to appear, Kristen received a call from David. Hearing him cry for help, Kristen rushed to the hospital. David, who had woken up, had secretly hidden the content of Matthew 13 from the Bible. Seeing the clock, he pulled out the infusion tube, successfully attracting the oncoming nurse. Just as David asked the nurse to get his phone, Linda walked in. Seeing the nurse being sent away, David gave up the struggle. After reinfusing David, Linda didn't forget to tie his hands to keep him from causing trouble. When David asked his wardmate Harlan for help, he found that the bed next to him had been replaced by an old woman's bed. In order to get the phone, David struggled out of bed and crawled over. Just as he was telling Kristen to save him, Linda hung up the phone directly. Back to the AR game, the hooked Ross showed up. After a bit of coaxing, Ben lured Ross to her room to play the Ouija board. Judy successfully located Ghana's address from the screen and informed Detective Mira. Mira arrived and arrested Ghana, finding the murder weapon in the trash. Ignoring Linda's obstruction, Kristen rushed to the hospital and found David. David handed her a note. Linda saw this scene. When she left the ward, Kristen was followed by Linda. Just as Linda demanded the note from Kristen, Kristen saw through her guilty conscience. Realizing David was over-medicated, she and the doctor went to the nurse's station to find Linda. But when they arrived at the locker room, Linda had already disappeared, leaving only a collection of wristbands behind. Upon returning to the ward, Kristen started to take care of David, who then handed over the previously hidden Book of Matthew to Kristen. In this episode, the Prophet Grace repeatedly emphasized Matthew 13, 25, which says that everyone is like the wheat in the kingdom of heaven, while Townsend and others from the Devil's 60 group are like the weeds hidden in the crowd. As the weeds and wheat look alike, only when they produce grain can they be distinguished, which implies that only when the members of the Devil's 60 group do evil can they be discovered. This explains why Kristen and her group always seem to be one step behind Townsend. After being discharged, David rushed to the residence of a woman named Sonia, who claimed a demon was whispering in her ear. Later, David knocked on Sonia's door. During their conversation, David noticed blood on the floor. While Sonia was making something, David followed the blood trail to the basement. Upon entering, he heard someone crying for help. At this moment, Sonia came from behind and struck David with a kettle. When David woke up, he assessed his injuries and noticed a man tied up across from him, who was actually a talk show artist. It's then revealed that in a bar the night before, the man was performing the talk show as usual. After the performance, Sonia invited him to continue their conversation at her house. She confessed that she was a fan of his and performed an imitation of his roach joke. 
However, the artist's expression changed, and he prepared to leave, but Sonia knocked him out with a bottle and locked him in the basement. Soon, Sonia went to the basement and played the artist's old joke about roaches from his radio show days. To prevent Sonia from doing anything rash, David suggested she talk to him. Sonia told David about the Rwandan genocide that occurred in 1994. It was estimated that at least two million Tutsi people died in the massacre, and she was a survivor. As for the artist, he had started telling the roach jokes for hundreds of days, which she believed humiliated the Rwandan victims. She was about to chop the artist when David managed to stop her. As Sonia sat down to calm herself, she looked at a crack in the wall. As if guided, Sonia cut off the artist's ear. After quickly bandaging the wound, Sonia left them alone and returned upstairs. In an effort to prevent Sonia from killing, David sought help through the ventilation duct. As luck would have it, his cries for help caught the attention of a dog walker. Just as he was about to respond, Sonia rushed over to close the ventilation duct. The concerned dog walker rang the doorbell. After a quick disguise, Sonia opened the door to meet the dog walker. As they chatted, Sonia reached for the machete. Seeing the dog walker's disbelief and his readiness to call the police, Sonia had no choice but to lie, claiming she and her husband were role-playing, which finally sent the dog walker on his way. Just then, Ben arrived as scheduled to pick up David and received a call from Kristen's husband, Andy, upon entering the house. Andy informed Ben that their youngest daughter was undergoing surgery at the hospital and unable to reach Kristen, he hoped that Ben could help contact her. After hanging up, Ben rushed to the courthouse to find Kristen. That morning, Kristen had received a call from her former boss, asking her to handle a previous case involving Orson at the courthouse. For some unknown reason, Orson, the serial killer who should have been found guilty, now had someone taking the fall for him. It's Dwight, the husband of Bridget who was claimed to be possessed. As Dwight was describing the case, Townsend arrived at the courtroom. Hearing Dwight's statement, Townsend sneakily watched Kristen. During the recess, Kristen, knowing that Townsend was causing trouble, found her detective friend Mira and informed her that Orson and Dwight were two separate cases. She also hoped that Mira would not assist the plaintiff. Nevertheless, Mira still sided with the plaintiff. Seeing this, Kristen had no choice but to write a note to her former boss at the attorney office, suggesting that he counterattack by accusing Mira of intentionally allowing a murderer to be involved in more homicides for the sake of increasing the sales of her book. This move once again offended Mira. When Kristen was called to testify, she was targeted by the plaintiff's lawyer for often ridiculing her patients. After the trial, Townsend found Kristen. Having gained the upper hand, Townsend began to mock Kristen, claiming he would first kill her four daughters, then her husband, and finally burn down her house. As Townsend was babbling, Kristen called out his real name, Jake Perry. Looking at Townsend's shocked face, Kristen mentioned his two previous marriages and even his embarrassing school days. Just as Townsend was about to make a threat, Kristen suggested he start living a decent life. Just then, Ben found Kristen. It turned out that while Andy was at home looking after their daughters, he also received the hospital diagnosis for his daughter. Seeing that something was wrong, his eldest daughter suggested that he contact the hospital. As he was about to ask what was wrong with his daughter, the doctor advised that the little girl should be brought to the hospital as soon as possible. Upon reaching the bedroom, he tried to call Kristen but received no answer. While his daughter was getting ready, he began to pray for her in the Buddhist way, a scene that was witnessed by his eldest daughter. When they arrived at the hospital, the doctor told Andy that the girl's EKG indicated a serious condition requiring immediate surgery. Unable to contact Kristen, Andy had no choice but to agree to the doctor's recommendation for surgery. Meanwhile, at David's place, Sonia continued to recount her experiences from the genocide. Just then, a sound seemed to emerge from the crack in the wall. Sonia moved to the side of the artist, looking at him as he apologized. Just as Sonia was expressing her forgiveness, she used a handgun to end his joking life. Afterwards, Sonia called the police and surrendered herself, but not without calling for an ambulance for David first. Over at the hospital, the newly arrived Kristen saw her daughters praying. Andy walked up. The doctor informed Kristen and her husband that during their pre-operation check, the youngest daughter's heart disease had miraculously healed itself. That night as they slept, the daughters continued to pray. Kristen also told her husband that she had decided to prioritize her career over climbing Mount Everest. She also became curious about the contents of the prayer. When she heard that Andy had prayed for their daughter's heart disease to recover at the cost of his own life, Kristen, who had experienced various demon-related incidents, seemed nervous and began to lose her faith in science. 
However, Andy on the side didn't seem to mind. After being exposed by Kristen, Townsend returned to his clinic and began psychotherapy. However, this psychotherapist was not the same as others. He wasn't human, but a demon with two cute but terrifying horns. During the night, Kristen encounters the haunting demon George once again. However, to the demon's surprise, what was initially intended to be a scare for Kristen ended in his own death by the scissors hidden under Kristen's pillow. As the demon draws his last breath, applause is heard from outside. Kristen stepped out, only to see the horned demon who told her that she should go mountain climbing. Before she could inquire further, the horned demon began clapping rhythmically. At this moment, Kristen is awakened by her second daughter, Lexis. As Kristen comforts her daughter to sleep, Lexis reveals she saw the same thing and coughs up blood, which fully wakes Kristen. The following morning, as Kristen is preparing her daughters for school, Lexis assures her mother that the thing in her nightmare cannot harm her. This instantly puts Kristen on alert. After seeing off her daughters on the school bus, she sees the serial killer Orson, who has been exonerated and was waiting outside. Orson tells Kristen that he has turned over a new leaf and hopes that they can be friends. However, Kristen takes out her phone and reports to the police about a potential molester, effectively turning away Orson. After that, the team headed to their next patient. It turns out the woman named Eleanor successfully conceived twins through IVF. However, she constantly felt as if her son was possessed by a demon. As Kristen tries to console her with her own pregnancy experience, Eleanor suddenly has an outburst. They decided to take her to the hospital for psychological treatment. After they leave, the doctor's secretary tells Townsend about what happened. When Kristen returns home, she confronts her mother about mountain climbing. She also asks her mother to cease contact with Townsend. This results in a heated argument over Townsend, with an angry Kristen warning her mother to make a choice between family or Townsend. Her mother, being in love, decisively chooses Townsend. After her mother leaves, her detective friend Mira comes over. She tells Kristen that Orson complained about her provocation. She also advises Kristen to stay away from Orson. Just then, Kristen receives a text from David. When they arrive at the church, an agitated Eleanor tells them that her unborn child is acting out again and requests David to perform an exorcism. To placate her, David hands her a cross to verify, but nothing happens. It's then that Eleanor suggests placing the cross on her belly. As David places the cross on Eleanor's belly and begins to recite a prayer, the unborn child inside her forcefully kicks the cross away. Meanwhile, as Townsend was studying the demonic mark of the 60 sigils, Kristen's mother came by. After a brief greeting, Townsend took Kristen's mother's keychain. At the same time, Orson outside was also asked to make a duplicate key for Kristen's house. Early in the morning, Kristen and her team informed the church's officials about the incident from the previous night, hoping for an exorcism. However, the officials rejected the request, claiming that demons cannot possess unborn children. Kristen received a harassing phone call from Orson. To be safe, Kristen asked Ben to upgrade the home security system. Once everything was in order, they took Eleanor to attend a mass. However, after Eleanor consumed the wafer, she collapsed in pain and started to bleed heavily. At the hospital, the doctors informed them that Eleanor's twin daughter had disappeared, but the good news was that the surviving son was healthy. Seeing Eleanor in pain, David agreed to help with an exorcism. In the meantime, while the church was preparing for the exorcism, Kristen returned home and handed over the new keys to her daughters. As she was bidding them good night, she noticed that Lexus had blood at the corner of her mouth. Suspecting it was caused by brushing her teeth, Kristen promised to make a dentist appointment and hurried off to Eleanor's house. On the other side, Townsend proposed to Kristen's mother publicly during dinner. Lexis, who was awakened by a knock on the door, opened the door to find the horned demon. After the exorcism, Kristen returned home to find Lexis collapsed on the floor. After putting Lexis to bed, Kristen returned to her room and took out a climbing axe. Ben came into the kitchen for a drink and heard the fat Christmas music from a doll. When they found out that the doll belonged to the RSM Fertility, they started searching online. David noticed that the Fertility Clinic's logo resembled the Euler Triangle. To find out more, David and Ben visited the clinic the next morning. While browsing through the brochures, they discovered that the clinic had offices in Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C. David immediately connected this to the three dots on the oil painting. As they were being introduced to the clinic, they saw the previously possessed Eric in the promotional video. David realized that the tears mentioned in the book of Matthew referred to the test tube babies born in the fertility clinic. Just then, they received news that Eleanor's water had broken. 
Seeing Kristen arrive, Ben noticed blood on her leg. But after a quick clean, Kristen insisted that there was no blood on her leg. As Eleanor gave birth, David told Kristen about what they had discovered during the day. Upon hearing about the RSM fertility, Kristen became anxious because her daughter Lexis was also born from a test tube at this clinic. Back at the studio, Kristen's mother came by. When she heard that she was getting married to Townsend and was hoping for her blessing, Kristen promptly shut her out of the door. Once back at the church, David took the hallucinogenic mushrooms and saw the vision of the horned demon harvesting wheat. Turning around, he saw that Kristen was approaching the horned demon. After confirming her daughters were asleep, Kristen returned to her own bedroom. Just then, she received a call from Mira. Mira told Kristen that Orson had died from a blunt force, and the suspect was his wife. After hanging up, Kristen went to the bathroom. As she thought about David's exorcism, she held a cross in her palm. Unexpectedly, a burn mark appeared in her palm. She looked at the mark and her reflection in the mirror. The show does not explicitly state that it was Kristen who killed Orson, but judging by the blood seen on Kristen's leg, it seems to indicate that Kristen was the culprit. With that, the first season of this drama comes to an end. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.